<laughs> but Sorry. we will be having the manager for sustainability and climate action from the county of San Diego speaking about the county the county's decarbonization plan. So uh, we'll all want to hear about that because it's a regional based plan for us here in San Diego County. And I'll just remind everyone before we get started that uh, we're going to put everyone on mute to keep a quiet line. And if you want to type in, if any questions pop up during the presentation, scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat icon. Hit that icon, a, a pop-up box will come up towards the side and feel free to type in your question as you think of it. And that way you don't have to remember it. And then at the end, we'll go through all of those questions. Okay, so with that tonight, I am pleased to introduce, we have Shreya Ramachandran who at the age of 13 <laughs> created her own nonprofit called the Gray Water Project. And I think back to what I was doing uh, when I was 13, it was not creating a nonprofit. So uh, huge kudos to Shreya to you for doing that. Um, and as a result, she received several climate prizes and has also been featured in the Smithsonian Magazine. And today she is a student at Stanford University. She's studying environmental science and uh, policy and a little bit of biology thrown in there. And with that, Shreya, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, so yeah, my name is Shreya. And as you already know, I'm the founder of the nonprofit, The Gray Water Project. I've been doing advocacy and outreach in the environmental space for the last five years. So I'm really excited to be sharing my story, talking to you all about gray water. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to be here with all of you tonight. So for the past few days, it's been raining quite heavily in the Bay Area, which is where I'm currently located. I managed to get completely drenched in the unexpected downpour. My shoes have still not recovered, they're still wet. <laughs> But despite that, don't let it fool you, California is in the midst of a crippling drought. The worst, the past 12 months have been the driest that we've seen in a century. And climate change is further exacerbating the issue as heat is causing the snowpack to melt faster. Just a week ago, every single one of California's 58 counties are under a drought emergency. Santa Clara County is urging its residents to reduce water use to 15% of its 2019 levels. And there's mandatory water restrictions in Marin County as well as recommendations for reduced water use for urban residents throughout the state. But it's not just California that's dealing with water scarcity. Two thirds of the world's population lives without access to clean drinking water for at least one month out of the year. And major cities around the world are grappling with the challenges of water shortage, most notably Cape Town, as well as Sao Paulo in Brazil. And this is something that's likely going to keep happening. Climate change is going to cause more extreme weather patterns, a cycle between drought and flooding. As more greenhouse gas emissions are released into the air, air temperatures are going to increase and more moisture is going to evaporate from land, lakes, rivers, and other bodies of water. Those warmer temperatures also increase evaporation in plant soils, which affects plant life, and that can reduce rainfall even further. And when rain does come to those drought stricken areas, the drier soils it hits are less able to absorb the water, leading to an increased likelihood of flooding. This means that already dry states like California are going to have a much higher drought risk. In Southern California, the frequency of extremely dry years is set to increase by 200% which is just astonishing if you think about it, given how much we already have to deal with drought. My first experience with drought actually came five years ago at the peak of California's last drought, which at that point was the worst drought we had ever seen. Um, and that, at that point, I visited the county of Tulare unexpectedly for an archery competition. And there I saw firsthand the crippling effects of drought. 
Until then, it wasn't something that had really affected my life all that much. I mean, I'd heard about it a little bit, and I knew that I was letting my lawn go dry because there were water restrictions, and we put where we were putting in like low flow faucets and shower heads, but it wasn't something that was radically transforming my day to day. It was more of a minor consideration, if anything. But that all changed when I realized that in some parts of California, people were trucking water in for even basic water needs like drinking or bathing. And that's just something that I didn't think could happen in the United States, something that could happen so close to my home. Um, but I realized that it wasn't just California that's dealing with this issue when I visited my extended family in India not long after that. I was staying in an apartment in one of the largest cities in India. And sometimes when you opened the tap, there would just be no water coming out, or it would be this light gust of air and dust or this murky brown substance that I didn't even really want to touch, let alone drink. And when I told other people about this, I would be like halfway through a shower and I was like soapy. And I was like, okay, so there's no more water. What do I do? This was something that was just normalized to everybody. No one really considered this to be something that was out of the norm or something that we needed to take action on. And it was through experiencing water scarcity firsthand, but also talking to people and hearing their stories that I realized what a global challenge water scarcity is and how necessary it is for us to take action on these issues. And what I realized increasingly is that we have a negative relationship with water. We use it and then we literally throw it down the drain. So my big question became, what are some ways that we can save water? And when I first started looking into drought solutions, I found that many conventional methods of water conservation just aren't enough or they don't work during drought situations. For example, rainwater harvesting is something that we talk about a lot, but in a place where the majority of the rainfall happens during the winter, but the majority of the water demand happens in the summer, you just can't build large enough rain barrels to accommodate for that demand to make rainwater harvesting a viable large scale solution. And again, you can't do rainwater harvesting if there is no rain. And other methods, for example, taking shorter showers or turning off the tap while brushing your teeth are extremely important, but they're not going to result in the large level of water savings that I was hoping to generate. So the question then is, what can you actually do to make an impact? And what I found is that there's actually three types of water. There's, um, there's white water, which is clean drinking water. Um, that's the kind of water that comes out of your faucets or your shower heads. And there's also black water, which is water from your toilet or from your kitchen sink. So you don't want to reuse black water, but what the other type of water is gray water which is lightly used water from sinks, showers, baths, laundries, basically any water that's been used once and can be used again. Right now, gray water and black water are sent down the drain together, meaning that we lose the potential for gray water to be reused. In fact, 11 trillion gallons of gray water go to waste each year in the United States alone. This means that an average American household wastes 180 gallons of gray water per day. And gray water is something that's produced by every household in every country across the world, meaning that it's a universal solution that's also very simple to implement. Now, you might be thinking, Wait, Shreya, you just told us that gray water is the soapy water that's already been used once. So how is that safe to use? Well, it's a bit more nuanced than that. Many commercial soaps and laundry detergents do actually have harmful chemicals that can be detrimental to soil, plants, and aquatic life. 
Um, but what I did is I conducted research on gray water to actually make sure that it's safe. And what I found is that it's really important to be conscious of the types of products that you use. I tested soap nuts, which are a berry shell from the Indian soap berry. Um, they're about this big. And when you put them in water, they actually release soap. And what I did is I wanted to see if we could, re if we could use soap nuts as an alternative laundry detergent whose gray water could then be reused for irrigation. I compared the gray water from soap nuts to the gray water from an organic detergent, non-organic detergent, as well as just regular water. And what I found was that soap nut gray water was not different from regular water. It actually led to higher plant growth and plant biomass because the materials that were in the gray water sort of act as a fertilizer. But I also saw that detergents with lots of salts, such as powder detergents, as well as um, detergents with a lot of heavy metals like boron, borax, those should be avoided because those components transfer to the gray water and then build up in the soil and they can be detrimental to plants. So in general, gain and tide are two detergents that I say overall just avoid them if you're going to do gray water reuse, but there's tons of other environmentally friendly soaps and detergents out there that you can use, like EOS, seventh generation, they're all great options. And if you can do soap nuts, they're also biodegradable and they're just really great in general. So these are all detergents that you could get at like Target or Walmart, just like regular stores around you making gray water reuse something that is accessible and something that can be done by everybody. However, when I talked to people about my findings from my research and when I tried to tell people about gray water, I was surprised that most people had never even heard what gray water was. And if they had, there was a lot of stigma surrounding it. They thought it was like this dirty water that they couldn't use. And it's often very difficult to ask people to bring up a conversation about their plumbing because it turns out that's just a little bit of a taboo topic for a lot of people. So that's one of the main reasons I started the Gray Water Project. The Gray Water Project is raising awareness about the benefits of gray water reuse and water conservation. I conduct workshops and presentations at a ton of community events, libraries, corporate groups, schools, to demystify gray water reuse and encourage people to take action on this issue. My vision for the future is for gray water reuse to be just as common as paper or plastic recycling. It should be something that everyone does and everyone has the ability to do. If you had like a scrap piece of paper or some cardboard, you know immediately what to do with that material. You know it goes in the recycle, um, and that's just something that's super easy to do and very normalized as well. And I want to get gray water reuse to be just as easy and just as accessible. In my view, education is a really important part of that. And that's why I created a gray water curriculum for elementary school students. It's a hands-on STEM curriculum that's just aligned to the next generation science standards. And it gives students the opportunity to connect the science with the real issues in the world around them. It's free for teachers to use and really low cost to implement. And it's been adopted already in schools locally as well as districts worldwide. And the idea is that if kids know the best practices for gray water reuse, they can make it a part of their everyday lives as they become adults. In addition to the curriculum, I also run water conservation challenges for kids and adults where you can track your progress with water saving actions. And I'm also currently looking at ways to make it more accessible and cost effective for people to recycle gray water in their own homes. And I'm working at the city and state level in California to make gray water pipelines readily available for new buildings. Yeah, so prioritizing water conservation is something that just needs to be done now, both in places that are drought prone, as well as in places that are fairly water rich. And if you want to get involved and you want to help secure a better water future for all of us, there's a couple of really simple things that you can do. Number one, and I'm sure you all saw this coming, is that you can reduce your house's water use. 
Simple household actions like checking for leaks or using low flow toilets, faucets, and shower heads can save huge amounts of water in the long run. And it's always best to combine these actions with other actions as well. So try to do as many of them as you possibly can. Secondly, you can use or find ways to reuse your house's gray water. You can do this informally by just pausing your laundry before the water drains, collecting that water and using it for irrigation or for toilet flushing or other purposes for cleaning. Um, but you could also, if you're a homeowner, you can install a laundry to lawn system, which is a way to take gray water from the laundry and then put it out for irrigation. And it's a fairly cheap DIY system that doesn't actually require a permit in many parts of the United States, including California. And the way it works is that you essentially, um, at the back of your laundry machine, you'll have a pipe that connects to the outflow to the drain. And you're taking that pipe and instead connecting it to a three-way valve that controls the flow of the water. So you can turn it one way so that it can go to the sewer. For example, if you used bleach that day or um, a different sort of detergent and you don't want that water to go out to the garden, you have the opportunity to divert that. But if you don't have that situation, then you can turn it the other way and divert the water to your landscape. And from there, it's just a simple system of one inch PVC pipes out to the base of the tree or the plant that you want to irrigate. So you have an anti-siphon to prevent the water from being sucked back into your machine, as well as a backflow preventer. You're transitioning from the outside of your home to, or sorry, you're transitioning from the inside of your home to the outside, as you can see in the picture to the bottom left. Um, and once you get closer to the area that you're interested in irrigating, you switch from that one inch PVC to half inch and the water will come out in a mulch basin at the base of your tree or your bed of plants. Um, and the only main thing to remember for this is to make sure that the little tap that you see that's in purple isn't touching the bottom of your emitter box. There should be a little bit of a space so that roots don't grow up into the pipes in search of water. Um, so overall, this is a system that you can use a lot of like reclaimed materials to purchase, or sorry, you can use a lot of reclaimed materials to do. Um, and the overall cost can be about $200, which is cheaper than a lot of other systems, but still a little bit more of an investment than just doing gray water reuse through like collecting the water in buckets. And I can always talk more about different types of systems like laundry to lawn systems at the end. And if you want to use sources that are a little bit more difficult to get, for example, sinks or bathtubs, for example, then you do need to pull a permit in order to install those types of systems. Laundry to lawn systems are a really awesome starter system because you don't need to pull a permit. It's fairly DIY. I largely installed the laundry to lawn system in my home. So if a teenager with limited plumbing experience can do it, then I'm pretty sure you can as well. But for more complicated systems, you will likely need to hire a plumber and get some help to do it. Um, one of those systems is a gravity flow branch to drain system where you cut into the plumbing to access the gray water from sources other than the laundry. Um, and you're cutting into the drainage plumbing in order to install a diverter valve, very similar to the one that you saw on the previous slide. So very similar to this, except for it goes in a different location. And from that, there's no storage tanks and the water flows easily by gravity, hence the name. And each branch in that system as well will end in a mulch basin to irrigate that area. And there's also a simple pumped system, which you can see here, if you can see my mouse. And in that system, water, water is first collected into a surge tank, and then it's pumped out to irrigate a larger area. So that can be especially useful if you have a yard that's uphill of your house, so you couldn't use a gravity system, or if you need to pump water over a large paved area. So every household's water use is different, but what's most important is that you're cognizant of your water use and you're actively working towards reducing it.
There's also a few other considerations for gray water reuse, just to get into the nitty gritty of it so that you're aware of these things. Um, if you're doing gray water irrigation, it's important to just be considerate of the types of plants that you're irrigating. The vast majority are compatible with gray water irrigation. Established trees, shrubs, ornamentals, most vegetables, all of those are fine. The rule of thumb though, is to just make sure that gray water is not touching the edible part of the vegetable. So avoiding root vegetables as well as young leafy greens is important for gray water reuse. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you should make sure that you're using an environmentally friendly detergent, um, powder detergents, detergents with chlorine bleach, as well as products with boron, borax, salt, sodium, and as I mentioned again, bleach. Those should not be used if you're going to do gray water reuse, but you can use detergents like soap nuts, EOS, um, seventh generation, all of those are okay. And if you're not on, if you're not super sure if the detergent you're currently using is all right, you can just check the ingredients list and see if we have any of those like do not use ingredients and just sort of go from there. Um, a lot of people have asked me how do you um, if the gray water they're using is like being bad for their plants. And one thing I've noticed is that generally when homeowners put in a gray water system, the plants are getting a little bit more water than they are usually used to because prior they wouldn't have been irrigated as often. So just being aware of how much water you are already using for outdoors and then budget and then setting up your system so that you're delivering that same amount of water and you're not like overwhelming your um, plants that you already have. So just keeping it consistent in the transition to a gray water system. And the last thing you can do is get involved. If you're interested in volunteering with the gray water project, um, then I would be super happy to talk to anyone who's interested in doing that afterwards. I'm also going to be launching in the upcoming days a revamped version of the gray water project's water challenge. Um, so that you can do it with teams and it's a five day challenge. So it's also fairly short. Um, so it would be amazing if some people from here could sign up for that and learn more about water saving actions that you can do. You can also get involved with change for, through policy. If your city has a climate action plan, then working towards making sure that water conservation and gray water reuse measures are implemented as part of that. Um, are also excellent ways to get involved. And I want to just leave us with one final closing thought. There's a lot of, one thing that I noticed in the in-between before, between the last drought in California and the one we're in right now, is when we got more water, people sort of forgot that the drought even happened. Um, people went back to their previous water use habits and it felt like there wasn't even a lot of change. And I want us to just understand that the earth will always have the same amount of water. And as the population grows, more and more people are going to have to share those same water resources. Ground and surface water supplies are dwindling and water demand is set to rise 55% by 2050. And saving water now protects wetlands, freshwater wildlife, and other habitats besides from just people that depend on those water resources. So even in the next couple, even in the next year or in the next couple of years, if California gets more rain, that is not a reason for us to stop doing our water conserving measures. We really just need to change the way that we as a society think about water. It's a precious resource that cannot be wasted. And through outreach in places that are currently in a drought, people can have a better understanding of how and why gray water can be used and the best practices to use it. And we can all bring change. Conserving water really does start with us and it's just one drop at a time. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Shreya. We appreciate that. Um, that is actually really cheap <laughs> to connect to your laundry system. So we'll have to look into that. 
Um, okay, so let me uh, look into questions here. We have a few. Um, and if others want to either go ahead and type in the chat, or if you want to take yourself off mute, go ahead and do that, and um, we'll field questions. Um, question is, what would a volunteer do if they signed up today? Yeah, um, there's a couple of different things. Um, you can get involved in starting a local chapter of the Greywater Project. So do what the larger organization does, but on a more regional level, focusing in on your area. Um, and you can also get involved by, as I mentioned earlier, joining the Water Challenge, um, supporting with like blog and newsletter, if that's something that's of interest to you. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to get involved based on your particular interests and your skill set and um, what, in what ways you're most interested in contributing. Yeah. I have a question. I'll just, people can just ask their questions, whether they can read them all. Um, but how much, how much water can you save? What's a typical household if they use the, some of your ideas, how much water do you think they could save? Yes. Any, any approximations? Yeah, so there's a lot of just generalizations that I can provide. It does depend on how much water you're currently using. And for example, if you're doing a laundry to lawn system, the amount of gray water you're generating depends on how many times a week you're doing the laundry and what type of washing machine that you currently have. So it is variant on a case by case basis, but on average, an average Californian home, around half of your water use is going to be for outdoor purposes. And um, by doing gray water, you can really dramatically cut down on the amount of outdoor water use that you have. So approximately like, if you're doing just a laundry to lawn system, about 20% of your house's water use again could be from laundry. And just like um, that amount of water is what could be saved. So again, a little bit of a generalization. It does depend um, on your house's water use, but hopefully that contextualizes a little bit. Yeah, so what it sounds like the, uh, the usage would be put into the ground that would grow plants. So it might not really affect your water bill unless you're... It would affect your water bill if you are currently irrigating your landscape. If you've got a backyard, if you have a vegetable bed, if you have fruit trees and you're using, if you're watering those plants, then if you put in a gray water system, then you're reusing the water that's already been used for like washing your hands or doing your laundry and then reusing that for the irrigation purpose. Yeah. Uh, Cynthia has a question. Cynthia, you want to just take yourself off mute and ask directly? Sure. <laughs> uh, I was wondering about the existence of, of grants or other uh, resources um, for people to help them set up gray water systems if you don't have a a setup where you can easily do it yourself. Yeah. So some municipalities and some counties have programs where if you do a gray water system, then you can get a rebate for it. So that reduces the cost quite dramatically. Um, and those are often offered for laundry to lawn systems, as well as some of the other like gravity based systems as well. So I think the first thing you could do is check to see if your water district um, offers a rebate program in that regard. There's also some options for you to be able to just get a gray water kit in the same vein. Um, some water districts provide them for people in their service area. So that's one way to, um, to like get a grant or have resources to set up the system. It, is, there a, the is there a website to buy the do-it-yourself kits? Yeah, so there's information on the Greywater Project's website for how to do these types of systems. I do not currently sell um, sell like pre-made kits, um, but the majority of the supplies that you need, you could probably get at your local hardware store with the exception of the three-way valve, which is something that you would most likely have to order separately. Okay, but there is information on your website to, to help get started. 
-hmm. and that is the graywaterproject.org. Yes, it's www.thegraywaterproject.org. The, okay, the yes. gray water, G R E Y. Yes. Okay. okay. And I can put the link in the chat as well. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you? That would be great. That way we have it captured. Um, I have another question as well, and that is why is kitchen water considered black water? Yeah, that is, it's not considered black water across the board, but in California it is. And I believe that's largely due to the fact that um, there's more oil and grease in kitchen gray water. Um, and people often use harsher soaps in um, the kitchen if you're washing dishes, for example. So I think that's one reason why kitchen gray water is considered black water here. Okay, yeah, because I know we have a big bucket in our sink. It just fits right in the sink and we got it from Walmart and it just sits in there. And then we use seventh generation dish liquid and we'll rinse off our plates, we'll collect that water and then go water plants. And they, they do just fine. In fact, they, they do, actually yeah. like, they like the little bits of food and, and everything that come off of that, so. Always curious question. Um, um, you mentioned that you want to be careful what kind of laundry detergents you use if you're going to have a, a, a laundry gray water project. What about um, bathroom soaps and shampoos and things like that? Yeah, the same sort of um, guidelines apply um, for essentially gray water from any source. I mentioned laundry detergents just because those are more common. That's like what people start out with when they do gray water. But if you're looking at like shampoos or soaps, it's the same sort of guidelines, like avoiding stuff with like borax um, and other things. Because if you're doing, if you're cleaning out your tub, if you're putting in bleach um, in your sink or your bathroom, then divert the valve so that you're not putting that out to your plants. Very good. Um, any more questions here? Hey, Jane has a question. Oh, go ahead. Is there any concern about like the sanitation of this water, like passing on, let's say salmonella or uh, other bacteria? That's a really good question. And it's actually a research question that I worked on for over a year. And the answer is no. Um, essentially, what I did is I tested various types of gray water, um, and I measured the amount of E. coli and fecal coliforms, which are really good indicator microorganisms, to see if the gray water, if it had that in the gray water, if that would be an issue for irrigation. So I tested the gray water, and I also tested the soil, the outside of leafy greens, um, root vegetables, and fruits, the outside and inside of the vegetable for those indicator microorganisms. And there was essentially no transference. Even if I inoculated really high levels of fecal coliforms or E. coli into the gray water, they died out very quickly and it did not contaminate the, um, it did not contaminate the vegetable in any way. So that shouldn't be a concern for gray water. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, good question. Tim, you have your hand raised. You want yes, to go ahead? Um, you're up at Stanford now. We UCSD here uh, has done big pushes for electric uh, grid generation, solar and conservation. Have you approached the Stanford people or universities to try to get uh, them put a little muscle into getting their own gray water recycled or used? Yeah, that's something I'm definitely looking into. Stanford at some newer buildings does do water recycling, but as with most places, it's something that could happen on a larger level. So it is something I'm looking into. I mean, a lot of it, it always seems to me that we're putting demands on individuals to make individual efforts at their own expense. I mean, time-wise also and inconvenience. And uh, large manufacturers or users of water, commercial sources uh, may be able to have some scale to it. Yes. Good, let me see. Any other questions? I think we're caught up in the chat. 
It's like well, Tim's raised Tim's raised his hand. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what, Freya? What kind of problems do you you like? I, we'd like to implement some of these things, but we have a, a slab, concrete slab foundation, which makes it really hard to access any kind of plumbing. We do have an area by our bathtub that we can access underneath and the drain from our shower maybe, but it's kind of hard to access. So some of this is kind of difficult to get in there and without a plumber's help. Mm -hmm. um, is that some of the feedback that you get? Like, is I'm, I'm trying to, yes. is, yeah, what do you Generally, think? Generally, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. You're, uh, yeah, what can you say about issues with just limitations on a home? Yeah, in some cases, it can be difficult to access the drainage plumbing. That is a challenge that you might run against. Um, you might have to just switch the type of system that you're going to implement. Like instead of like a simple gravity one, you might want to consider another type of system. Um, but if it's not a no permit system, if it's a system that requires you to pull a permit, then I would highly recommend that you work with a plumber. Um, unless you have like a lot of experience, I'd recommend that you work with a plumber to put in your gray water system. And it's not something that you would want to do independently uh, for the entirety of it. Yeah, I know I, I visited a couple of people's homes, like Elizabeth, their home here, here on the top of the hill. You could use a gray water project and do the gravity feed. And Cynthia, same with your house. You have a, we talked about that at your last, um, when we got together last time. Um, but Our laundry to, is already gray water, so. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, nice. it has been for years now. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Excellent. Yeah. But yeah, that's a good, to be able to access those. I, Cynthia, we, we should look into getting your place because yours is a perfect opportunity to use gray water for your garden. Let me know if it's something that you do. I'd love to hear back. Okay. I have another question, if I may. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, do you think that there might ever be a time where in built, like in building standards that they might think in, in terms of new home construction, that this would be uh, kind of a, a standard option to use uh, this recycled water or not exactly recycled, but the gray water for uh, landscape irrigation, for example. Yes, that's something that I would very much like to see. And that's one of the pushes that I'm working on making to try and get the um, just the conduit set up for gray water systems. So you just have, you don't have all the piping put into place yet, but when new homes are built to just have the diverter valve, for example, or have a place where you can access the drainage plumbing, I would like that to be implemented in green building codes um, so that it's like easy for people to come in retroactively and put in gray water systems as well. So that is that is definitely something that I'm really hoping to see happen more of um, going, going forward. Okay, Harriet, you wanna ask your question? Take you off mute. I can read it for you if you want. Uh, I was just oh, making sorry. a general comment that uh, um, I've, I've actually talked to lots of different people about different sorts of issues, and we only pay $6 for 1,000 gallons of water. And our basic bill for, for myself, as a person who lives alone, my basic bill is, is like $100. So if I have a guest for uh, a month or uh, um, I, I'm watering some avocado tree, my bill is $6 higher. And, and for a, a gray water system, I would actually do it because philosophically, I, I like aesthetically to be using gray water, uh, basically getting two uses out of the water for, for one price. But at the same time, I'm also on a slab and it's very, very hard to, uh, to get access to any, any kind of the, uh, the, the plumbing, even with a plumber. And um, so it, it's, it's just, I mean, $6 for a thousand gallons. It's like, yeah, it would only cost $200 to put in a system, but um, yeah, that the payback, if it's gonna, I mean, it, it, it might save you, I don't know, um, 
20 or $30 a year. And, and at that payback, it's, it's just really, it's a hard sell financially for people who are not philosophically committed. And I will note that there are 22 people here. So we are all philosophically committed, but, uh, but, but someone commented before about, about it being an expense that got pushed onto individual homeowners. And if, if houses could be built this way, this would make so much more sense. Um, I, I, you know, but I mean, if, if individuals have to pay for it, it's uh, especially here, I, $6 yeah. for a thousand gallons. I could hardly believe it. I mean, it's just, it's insane. Yeah, I definitely agree. Water is something that is quite cheap, um, but we don't have a lot of it. So doing, doing things like gray water reuse is really important, but it's not quite incentivized the right way which is why policy change is also really important when it comes to this issue. So yeah, I do, I do sympathize and I agree with what you're saying as well. Uh, show of hands, how many people think they could like, they would like to pursue some type of gray water system in their home? Everybody? Pretty much. Uh, so Elizabeth, tell you have a gray water, pro, gray water system in your home that was built a long time ago. Well, it's just from the laundry. And, and okay. that, that's the easiest access in the house, as, you, as you pointed out. And it just goes out and launder, launders. Water is part of the uh, orchard. Okay. So yeah, the rest of it would be somewhat more difficult because we all have that slab issue here, I think. Is, is there, with the slab, is there any um, movement at all in California about installing them in new houses as they're built, as the slab, before the slab is poured? It's not something that is happening on a large scale level, but it's something that I'm personally trying to get it so that you have gray water ready pipelines in new homes. That's yeah. a project that I'm personally trying to advance and it's something I'd like to see more of but statewide, it's not something that's currently being discussed very much. Yeah, interesting, might come later. I was gonna say that that's probably something that we could help with maybe in getting policy changed. I know that Harriet was talking about how the low cost of water, and there's a reason for that, is because the local water company wants to sell their water they don't want us conserving because they, they want that $6 per thousand gallons that they get. So they discourage us from conserving so they can continue to sell water. And uh, we, need, we need to raise our voice and get the Fallbrook Public Utility District and to change that policy. Yeah, Shreya, we live in a strange area. We pay a lot of money just for delivery. That's <clears throat> There's no way around that. It's a fixed amount every month there's no there's no incentive to save, right? It's it's not really set up. Set up our price. base our base charge is like a hundred dollars. Yeah. And if, if the base charge was a, was twenty dollars, and then we paid something like thirty or forty dollars per thousand gallons, my bill would come out to be roughly the same. But for people who who are are just like there's no incentive to save six dollars for a thousand gallons and your bill is already going to be like a hundred or hundred and twenty dollars that's i mean you can't you can't get rid of that that's the the water and sewer charge and it it is what it, it's fixed at what it is because we have a lot of growers in our water district and they run our water district they sit on the board of our water district and so they make the policies, the pricing policies to advantage the avocado and other groves, grove growers. Is that a little bit different than your Fremont and Northern in the Bay Area? Is that a different system? Than what there is talking? still a base water charge, um, but it's not, but yes, that is the, Incentivizing gray water reuse is something that is a challenge like everywhere, not just because of the cost, but also because some people are just like philosophically like opposed to it because they don't understand what gray water is or why it could be beneficial 
or even why it's like super important given our current climate and situation. Yeah. Um, Shreya, you just one more question. That is, you mentioned something about Santa Clara County reducing their water use, and and what you said was reducing their water use to 15% of what it was in 2019. Mm -hmm. Do you mean reducing it by 15% or actually reducing it to 15% of what they used? Uh, no, reducing the water use um, by 15% of what they had been using in 2019. Ah, yes, yeah. that's, that's what I thought you meant. Because if they were trying to reduce to 15%, <laughs> that, mm -hmm. would, that, that would, would be, be a lot, yes. <laughs> that would be hard. Well, you mentioned uh, education, that there's a free, something free for teachers that mm -hmm. you could give a teacher, uh, is it a, a Yeah, it's a uh, set of lesson plans to teach about gray water and water conservation. And it's a lot of like hands-on STEM activities. And it's something that can be dovetailed into a science unit, something about the water cycle. It's essentially a flexible piece of curriculum that the teacher can use to teach about these sorts of topics. And right now it's for um, the elementary school level. So like grades three to five, it can be um, adapted to do middle schools as well. Um, and yes, it's free for teachers if they want to use it and fairly low cost to implement in the classrooms as well. How do they access that? Um, you can submit a form through the Gray Water Project's website. And generally what I do is I work with the teachers to see if they want to um, in court, like customize it for their particular, for what they're particularly doing. Um, if some students have already learned about some of the material or they want to add other things. So that's the way to contact me. We have an elementary science teacher that signed on tonight, but she hasn't, she's not here, but I'll pass this on to her because she was previously looking for a climate change curriculum for her students. So she may very well be interested in this also. Thank you. Nice. Thank you all so much for the thoughtful questions. Yeah, um, let me just finish. We have a couple more on the chat here. Um, and Michael has a question. Yeah, and Shreya, I, I made a comment in the chat that you just might want to take a look at. But also, you know, people have mentioned slabs. Um, I'm not currently a contractor. I have a totally different profession. But I do have a lot of experience with slabs. Um, um, half my house now is currently on a slab. And you, it, it's not that difficult to process to um, put to divert your plumbing around the slab. I mean, it, it, and if you just visualize this, you know, and and people, lots of times people do this before things go bad because plumbing has a life, and. It's basically sort of a maximum of about 40 years. And stuff that's the plumbing that's built into a slab, it's going to go at some point. And say your house is 32 years old and it hasn't gone, and you want to do a gray water project, it's almost an ideal time to just, you know, to take you know, and, and divert around what's in the slab. And, you know, PVC is not expensive. And it's basically, you know, building with tinker toys. And uh, it's, you know, everything runs downhill. It's just gravity. And uh, it's, you can teach yourself in a few hours. It's just all the parts and, and the glues work really, really well. Michael, you have experience doing this? Excuse me? Excellent. Do, the question was, do oh, you have experience, you have experience doing this, Michael? Do I have a what? Experience. experience. Um, yeah, I, 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 but, but I've actually just been working with a landscaper to, to redo the sprinkler system at my house. And we, we went underneath the house to, to look at the, the diversion that was done 
uh, the, the, from my slab and we just double checked everything. And yeah, it's not, um, yeah, I mean, I, I used to be a general contractor a long time ago. Now I'm a lawyer and a financial planner, but that really has nothing to do with it. Um, you know, with YouTube, YouTube is a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, tool. Um, you can basically, I, I don't think I've ever run into anything I want to do that I haven't been able to find on YouTube. YouTube University. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Susan has a comment. Susan, you want to just share that with us directly? Still, if not, I'll go ahead and just read it here. Uh, San Diego County doesn't have any rebates for gray water that she's aware of, but they do have some for rain barrels and lawn replacement. And in the chat is a link where you can go to San Diego County.gov backslash a bunch of other stuff um, on getting rebates for that. So all under the umbrella of water conservation. I actually did go and get a, a, a rain barrel and it holds 50 gallons. But I mean, really in terms of the irrigation water that's needed in my yard, it would it would not last a day. And, and I guess I just started to look at, I was gonna have to adjust the downspouts and build a platform for it and, and all this extra work of installing it and putting it in place. And again, it would save me three cents worth of water and, <laughs> It would really just, it would be a lot of work. And then you have to wash it out every year because it gets bacteria and algae in it. And I'm just kind of looking at this and going, oh my gosh, this is just so much work. And, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's going to use up a, a, a lot of time and effort. And, you know, I, I, was, I was heartened that your comments that, uh, that algae and stuff, uh, that contaminants don't, in, don't infect the plants. But even so, I mean, that, that, that water would be full of whatever that comes, that washes off the, the roof. And oof, I mean, it's, it's uh, well, I just gave up is what and I And I think for us here in Southern California, I mean, anything we can do, great, right? The water bucket in the kitchen sink or the rain barrel, mm -hmm. that's all great. I think gray water is great because it's a consistent use of water. Yes. That's, you know, 365 days out of the year. Um, and even versus if just you can't winter. put in a gray water system beyond that of like a laundry landscape, there's still other ways that you can do gray water reuse, just like stopping the laundry and collecting the water or finding, or just like having a rain bucket in your shower or having a, a bucket in your shower and collecting the water before the water heats up or just reusing used pasta cooking liquid. Just when you start looking for sources of gray water, I find that you sort of just start seeing them everywhere. And there's lots of different ways to do gray water reuse. Putting in a system, of course, once you put it in, you don't have to think about it as much. Um, other things that you have to do more manually require a little bit more elbow grease and more thought in your everyday, but it's still totally doable and worth it, in my opinion. Yeah, very, very well said. And actually a really good way to kind of recap all of our discussion. Uh, so with that, we're pretty much right at the end of our time. If there's any final burning questions, now's the time. You can always reach me through the website, which is in the chat, thegraywaterproject.org, gray with an E. Um, and also the email address is the same. It's thegraywaterproject at gmail.com. So if you have any questions um, you want to toss my way, I'd be happy to answer them. Very good. Well, Shreya, thank you so much for your time. We know you are very busy. It is in the middle of midterms. <laughs> so we all remember how those days are. So we really appreciate your time and also thank your roommates for uh, kicking them out of the room <laughs> so we could have a quiet line. We really do appreciate that. So thank, thank you, you so much. much. Very important. It's really topic. wonderful being here. Um, and of course, let me know if you guys end up implementing gray water or if I can help in any way. I'd be happy to keep in touch. Good, we will. Good luck with your midterm. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Shreya. Thank you. Good night, everyone. See you next month. Thanks, Shreya.